are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again, and today we have another awesome show lineup for y'all today. We have a special guest, a amazing uh, music composer, Tina Davidson. She has an amazing website, tinadavidson.com. We're going to talk about her book today, her memoir, Let Your Heart Be Broken, Life and Music of the Classical Composer. She has a pretty impressive uh, resume that we'll kind of dive into a little bit today. But first, we're going to get to know her as a person. So first and foremost, thank you for your time, Tina. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Man, we appreciate you taking time talking to us. So uh, before we dive into your your memoir, your, your book, and all that is about your story. First and foremost, kind of introduce yourself to the crowd, uh, a little bit about yourself and what got you into music. Oh, thank you. Yes, so again, my name is Tina Davidson, and I am a classical composer. So a classical composer writes out of a classical music tradition. Doesn't necessarily sound like Bach or Beethoven. In fact, it really doesn't. But it is... Like any kind of tradition, it reflects life and what we're going through right now, but in terms of music. So I've been doing that for 45 years plus, um, and um, I have recordings, I have performances, um, and um, I also just released a book in March called Let Your Heart Be Broken, Life and Music from a Classical Composer. Um it's a memoir, and it reflects not only on my growing up, but my musical process and how I write music. And what was some of the things that inspired you? Did you have any background with family that was also into composing, or did did you kind of stumble into this yourself? Well, um, my mother always got me to play the piano. She was an English teacher, but she was a, a very avid violinist. So she really wanted me to play the piano. She wanted us all, I was the oldest of five, um, play the piano. And it wasn't until I was in college that I started writing music. Um, And I have to say that growing up as a pianist and playing in conservatories, et, et cetera, and being a fairly good pianist, I had never played any music um, written by a woman composer. So that was really interesting that I didn't have the role model. Um, so when I started writing music, I, I was pretty reluctant. But soon I just loved what I was doing. And I decided that I really needed to write music. And in your memoir, Let Your Heart Be Broken, you describe thinking that you were adopted. Can I explain that to the audience? (laughs) And how did you come to that solution? Yes. So um, I was born in Sweden uh, and I was placed in a foster home when I was about probably a six months old um, in a Swedish family. Uh, my mother had had me in Sweden and placed me in this family. And my Swedish mother was Solveig. And I lived there for three years until I was three and a half. Um, I had three older brothers, one of whom was only a couple months older than I was. And we were kind of brought up as twins. And then um, one day, you know, a beautiful uh, American woman came uh, who was a college professor and she adopted me and took me to America and she married and I became eventually the oldest of five children. Um, the thing was, is that um, I, I didn't know much about my adoption. Um, I, I knew that my mother was very reluctant to talk about it. Um, So when I was 21, I happened to actually be going back to Sweden, of all things. And um, I was uh, taking care of a family, uh, a daughter of a family friend for the summer in Sweden. And I decided to visit the adoption agency. And they said, well, come on down. I think we have some information. And so I went down and she was reading a letter that my biological mother had um, left there in the files. And it turns out that my adopted mother was actually my biological mother. So I had grown up 
uh, thinking I was adopted, uh, being told I was adopted. And in fact, uh, I had been adopted or uh, taken out of the foster home by my biological mother. So um, that was uh, quite a disturbing thing for me to learn. So let me get this straight. So <laughs> you thought you were adopted and you came to find out the woman that you thought adopted you was actually your biological mother. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. how did that make you feel? I mean, did you, uh, were you close with your mom as far as your relationship goes? And and if that conversation came, it sounds like that conversation came up between you and your, your bi- biological mother. How did that conversation uh, flow? How did it come about? And were y'all close, uh, closer or, you know, before or after? How, how was that for you? Well, I was very close to my mother. Uh, my mother uh, never distinguished between me and, and any of the other kids. I had no reason to think that I was any less loved. But I think when a child knows that there is this word between them and your family that you were adopted, I, I certainly had very secret feelings about that. I felt like... um you know, they would talk about relatives or family stories or your grandmother did this and your grandmother did that. And I knew that that wasn't my grandmother, that those stories weren't my history. And I always yearned to reach out and touch the body, the body I had born out of. So when I found this news, it was it was very disturbing. It was sort of as if I had based my life on this word adopted that I felt alienated. And I also had suffered a great deal of uh, depression as a child and continued to for a long time. And so it was sort of like the rug was uh, pulled out from underneath me. And I, I just didn't know what to make of it. It was so astounding. Um and when I told my mother, um, you know, she still felt, she always felt that it was her story and that it really didn't really have much to do with me, which of course is not quite accurate. I certainly didn't feel that way. Um, so the 10 or 15 years after that were were very difficult for me. I was very angry and um, upset about it. She didn't want to come th- come clean if she didn't want to tell anybody that I was her birth child. So it was a difficult time. And let me say that it is with understanding that being born in the 50s, having an illegitimate child in the 50s was very difficult. It it wasn't something that, you know, society really liked, and it would have probably cost her her job. And this was a very ingenious solution. However, that she kept it from me um, deeply hurt me uh, in ways I don't think she had anticipated or even uh, accepted a lot of the times. Once again, I'm talking to our guest today, Tina Davidson, here on Refocus Radio. And, and so to make it clear for our audience, um, after you found this out, you spend most of your life thinking that you were adopted. So after you found this out from your mom, did this bring y'all closer together? Were there any kind of strain to the relationship after finding this out, the way you found out, or did it kind of bring y'all closer? It it didn't make us closer. It was a it was a real strain. It's interesting that, um, and and I write about this a lot in the memoir. This trying to understand and place my birth story really became very important when I was 30 and I had my my daughter. Um, And I realized that I had a lot of unhappiness about this, uh, a lot of anger, a lot of um, depression, and that if I didn't really figure it out or really try to understand this trauma I was going to sort of uh, give it to my daughter in in um, unknown ways. I would sort of pass it on to her. And that really motivated me 
I, I really wanted to be the best parent that I could be. It motivated me to get into therapy and started to really look at this issue. And what was interesting is that it really started to creep into my music. Uh, so I was not only talking about it and thinking about it and, you know, writing uh, in my journal about it, but I was also writing music about it. So for instance, I have a cello a quartet, which is called Dark Child Sings. And it's really about that child in me that was sort of left in Sweden that that had all these dark, sad things to talk about and was trying to grow in understanding and find joy. Man, that's that's that is so profound. I can't even imagine uh just thinking that you were adopted and then to come out find out later that no you weren't. I mean, I can't imagine how how I would feel. I mean, you're going through all those years thinking in one way and then it's like your whole world is is like flipped over. And it is flipped over. Mm-hmm. You seem like a very positive person though. So was music a outlet for you to not just express yourself creatively, but kind of to use it as a platform to, you know, bring joy to other people? Well, it certainly was a platform for me to try to understand myself better. And um, I think that's, you know, certainly writing my memoir and composing music have are all ways that I've tried to understand myself better and tell that story so so that other people can hear it um, and perhaps um, resonate with it in some sort of way. Perhaps um, th- that will speak to them. Um, so I um, I do think that music has been very healing for me, and it's also been a very safe place. It's um, a place where I can go that <laughs> nobody bothers me too much. I'm, I'm almost in a world of my own. And that's been really wonderful. But also having good friends, working hard, um, trying to understand things, doing a lot of forgiveness practice um, has been very, very important as well. And speaking of uh, forgiveness practice, you have written a lot about that part and grieving. When it comes to um, your book, your memoir, what was uh, the value in your life um, that you used to turn the page, if you will, to go forward, to Mm -hmm. not stay stuck, but to continue to live your life? Well, I think um, walking into... Uh, the sadness of your life. And, and and we all have sadness and we all have grief. We all have heartbreak. And, uh, you know, even the title of my book, Let Your Heart Be Broken, is this idea of you don't go and look for being heartbroken, but if it's happened to you, um, to really walk up and meet it and grieve it and um also take the lessons learned from it. You know, it's it it changes you and it can change you so much for the better. It can maybe make you more empathetic or more loving or um uh, and surviving something uh can make you much more positive. It's a real gift in terms of learning the craft of life, of finding new ways to uh, keep on going forward. Um, so one of the things that I did, and I have it in my book, is I I decided I would make up a forgiveness practice for myself. I, I very much felt very burdened by my anger uh, towards my mother and and also my stepfather, and so I had a, I was living in Philadelphia, and I had a dog, um, a very muscular dog, and I, you know, he kind of she kind of like pulled me around the streets, but every morning and afternoon I would walk my dog and. I decided that I was going to say, I forgive you um, to all the people in my life. Um, And what was even better, I didn't actually have to mean it. All I had to do was to say the word, I forgive you. So I would start with myself and my daughter and my ex-husband and my siblings and my friends. And about 15 minutes into the walk, when it was really getting hot, 
I would be at my mom and my stepfather. And, you know, it just came out like in such anger, you know, I forgive you. I can't believe you did this to me. Um, And I did that for about a year. And what I noticed was that I became less angry. Uh, I, it was easier to say, I forgive you. And then when I was with them, I noticed that I didn't feel so um, nervous when I was with them, or I didn't, um, you know, I could stay in the room and not feel like I had to escape. You know, they gave me a present for Christmas and I could say thank you. And what happened for me was that I felt that I could be kinder to them. I was really brought to kindness. And that was huge for me to be able to be with them and not feel that intensity of feeling that I had used to feel. So that was a a big way of how I did it. And I recommend it. And I love that, you know, I would say it, I didn't have to mean it. So I could just say it as many times as I want to, wanted to. And slowly it started to seep in and seep down in, in through me. You listen to Ivy Focus Radio talking to our guest today, Tina Davison. Go to her website, tinadavison.com. And as a composer, let's kind of brag a little bit about your accomplishments because you have received a lot of great praise and acknowledgement from very prestigious platforms. I mean, Philadelphia Inquirer, Washington Post, New York Times. They shared some very um, positive reviews on your work. When you look back and, and see how your work has been able to reach a professional level that really sets the tone on how people, you know, receive your work and, and, and review it, how does it make you feel that you've been able to use your art and your craft in such a way that it's been recognized from very prestigious platforms? You know... It's really interesting, you know, um, the reviews in a New York Times is sort of on the same level as going into a public school and and teaching kids who've never written music how to write music, and they're so excited and happy about it. It doesn't seem like one thing is is higher than the other uh, or more important than the other. Um, I. love writing music. I teach music to almost anyone. I, you know, I don't believe that you have to have a musical training to start getting into writing music. Maybe once you've decided you really want to do it, uh, then you might need some training. Um, I teach uh, composition the way, I don't know, the way we all learned how to paint. You know, we went into the kindergarten room and there was an easel with paints and we just did it. And it was expressive and, and important. So I really trust and believe that we all have that creative ability. Some of us tend to want to pursue that and um, work on it. Others take that creativity and do something else. Uh, maybe you have a startup company or I don't know. But all those things are creative. So I I love both parts of my writing music. I love composing. I love to work with ensembles and, and have them sort of uh, flesh out my music and really make it a reality. I love going to performances and feeling my music sort of waft over the listeners and um know that they are sort of inhaling um, my music and I love teaching it to to anybody. And with your journey throughout your whole life, uh, like reclaiming yourself through therapy and spiritual practice, you also, as a single parent, you were creating your works and building your, your craft and leaving your legacy. So when you look at that, What's one thing that uh, you learned the most throughout this whole time, you know, building your Mm -hmm. your career? Boy, it's very, I don't think I could pick one, but let me just step aside and say something about all the parents out there who are 
trying to create or do a job and and raise children uh, at the same time. It's such a difficult job. And uh, I think you're always torn between having the time for your work and then having time for, for your child. And I think a lot of artists sometimes think that they can't have children, uh, you know, that it's it's not possible to do both. And I don't really have an opinion about that. I think that my daughter was um, almost a beginning of me choosing to live again um, and to do the work that I needed to do. So I owe that experience and that uh, connection so much. And I, you know, and it, of course it gets into your music. It's it's sort of six of one, half a dozen of another. You might not have as much time to write your music, but you have different things to write about, uh, you know, deep connections that are, go on that are deeper than just, um, words, you know, with, a, with a child. It's about history and about bloodlines and about this delicious soft flesh, these little, little children. So. I wish I could answer your question and give you one thing, but I do know having my daughter gave me the courage to move forward and to really um, create my own life. So I, it, I wasn't thrown around by past the past, um, really get on top of it. And what was your relationship with your daughter? Was it was it a lot closer than your relationship that you had with your mom? I think so because um, I really had to learn the hard way between privacy and secrets. I mean, we all are entitled to privacy, uh, especially if it's something that might really hurt somebody else. Um, but secrets, especially if you have a secret about somebody else, um, it can be very hurtful. And my daughter, when she asks me a question about the past, and even if it's painful for me to have to say, yes, that happened, um, I think she knows she can really trust me. And I think that is almost priceless, that kind of trust. And for our listeners, um, anyone out there who might feel like they been let down and they might be struggling with overcoming that situation and, and moving beyond that that chapter in your life. Based on your own experience, what would you uh, encourage them to do that kind of helped you along the way recovering from that that brokenness? I, I think um, finding a community of supportive people or friends is so important. I, you know, just a place where you can talk about yourself and not feel judgment, whether that's at a therapist's office or a close friend or maybe at church or, uh, you know, I think that's, for me, that's the most important thing is um, getting support, however you do that, um, not being alone. Um, and sometimes when you're really burdened and really suffering, it's it's so hard to reach out. I get that. But I do think that is sort of the chink in the wall. You know, the door that you didn't expect to be there is support from others. You said earlier about people breathing your music. I thought that was very unique. I like that. What do you oh. hope people uh, will appreciate with your style of your composing what do you hope that they can um take away from what it is you want to contribute contribute into the world space of music when it's all said and done yeah i think um i'm i'm really interested in energy like how uh, the rhythms of your life, like if you're running and you sort of start to listen to the pattern of your feet, and then you kind of imagine other people running with you and that that evolution or that growth of energy. And and sometimes when you're running, you're so tired, you're just exhausted. And I, I'm really interested in that mo moment where your physical energy runs out. And I always fantasize 
that at that moment, you know, your body kind of breaks up, but your heart lifts up and it goes upwards, upwards to to whatever you want to call God, the higher power or the sky or the wind. But I'm also very interested in that moment where your body can no longer hold on, but there is this other beautiful energy that comes out. Once again, you listen to Refocus Radio, talking to our guest, Tina Davidson. Go to her website, tinadavidson.com. And also go get her, her memoir. You can get on Amazon, Let Your Heart Be Broken, Life and Music from a Classical Composer. I want to say again, uh, thank you, Tina, for your, uh, for your time and also sharing your story with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. <laughs>